He prophesied that the saints would yet go to the Rocky Mountains. So wrote Anson Cull in 1842, explaining that the prophet Joseph Smith stood with a tumbler of water in his hand, he further reported, This water tastes much like that of the crystal streams that are running from the snow-capped mountains. Ah, the beauty of those snow-capped mountains, and the cool, refreshing streams that are running down through those mountain gorges. Each season, in its own turn, intrudes upon the last, giving rhythm to time and marking the passage of the years. But there are those who say it was not always so. They say that in the faraway past, spring did not come. It was forever winter. For many years, ice covered a large part of the land that we know as North America. Then. As the climate warmed, the ice receded slowly, leaving behind great inland seas. Among these was Lake Bonneville. It is said that the lake at one time covered 19,000 square miles. The waters of this vast inland sea receded, leaving behind a shoreline 1,000 feet above the present valley floor. The mountains which had enclosed the shoreline of the ancient lake became a barrier to the outside. No river escaped to the sea, but flowed inward to the numerous small lakes and plains that became the Great Basin. One of the lakes, 80 miles long and 35 miles wide, became bitter and salty with minerals it could not send to the ocean. It became known as the Great Salt Lake. The rest of the basin left exposed by the retreating waters is as varied as it is vast. Much of it is desert land, alkaline valleys, sagebrush, greasewood, and cactus, forming a home for only the most resourceful animal life. The mountains of the Great Basin, more than 160 ranges of them, mostly stretching north to south, capture the rain and snow, start the water on its way into the self-contained river systems of the basin. In these mountains, in easy reach of water, the wild animals of the Great Basin flourished. It was here that they found food, for the retreating lakes and the recurring snows and rains provided a near-perfect mineral balance in the fertile soil. Grass was plentiful. Inevitably, into this vast, enclosed area of mountains, rivers, and deserts came man. Several tribes of Indians dwelt here, Ute, Paiute, Shoshone, Navajo, or Goshute, traveling with tribes along the rivers of the basin, hunting and fishing, or moving their families across the desert valleys, digging sago roots, eating seeds, or the big black crickets so common in the foothills. These early inhabitants lived in the land around them. Not disturbing their environment, they survived in it. The first white men arrived in the Great Basin on September 23, 1776, from Santa Fe, looking for a commerce route to Monterey and access to goods shipped from Spain and Mexico. The men were 10 in number, headed by the Catholic fathers Francisco Antonesio Dominguez and Francisco Silvestre Vallés de Escalante. The journal of the expedition describes their route as northwesterly through the western part of what is now Colorado, then westward across the Green River, which they called Rio San Buenaventura, the Good Luck River, or the River of the Blessed Fortune the waterway to the west. The fathers continued up to Shane Canyon, down Diamond Fork, and into Spanish Fork Canyon, which inherited its name from the two Spanish fathers. They camped by what is called Utah Lake and learned from the Indians their name for the lake, 
Timpanogo, or Fish Lake. The Indians themselves were called Timpanagotsis, or fish eaters. From the diary of the expedition, we learn, the lake, which must be six leagues wide and 15 leagues long, extends as far as one of these valleys. It runs northwest through a narrow passage, and according to what they told us, it communicates with others much larger. The other lake, according to what they told us, covers many leagues, and its waters are noxious and extremely salty, for the Timpanois assure us that a person who moistens any part of his body with the water of the lake immediately feels much itching in the part of his body that is wet. But the fathers and their party did not explore the Salt Lake, nor did they cross to the ocean. In late September, on their way south, they cast lots and decided to proceed to Santa Fe. It was too late to cross the basin, and much too late to attack the Sierra Nevadas. They returned through southern Utah into Arizona, then east to the Colorado River. The swift current kept them from crossing there, so they went north up the river to a point where they were able to chisel steps into the sandstone to get their animals down to the level of the Padre Creek, which ran into the Colorado River. The place where they crossed has been named the Crossing of the Fathers. In the late 1700s, white men began to make their way into the basin area, hunting and trapping. Peter Skeen Ogden of the Hudson Bay Company was one of the first trappers. Ogden and his company trapped along the course of the Bear River, the Logan River, and Blacksmith Fork. At one point in their journeys, William Kitson of the Ogden party wrote, We are now in a hole, as I may say, as the place is surrounded by lofty mountains. They called it Ogden's Hole. The many unexplored and untrapped waterways brought others. Outstanding among these was Jedediah Smith. In the late 1820s, he made several excursions into the Great Basin area, making maps and keeping notes of his travels. We dug holes in the sand and laid down in them for the purpose of cooling our heated bodies. Our sleep was not reposed, but tormented. Nature made us dream of things we had not, and for the one of which it seemed possible, or even probable, that we would perish in the desert, unheard of and unpitied. They did not perish, but continued on into the Salt Lake Valley. Those who may chance to read this at a distance from this scene may perhaps be surprised at the sight of this lake, surrounded by a wilderness of more than 2,000 miles diameter, excited in me those feelings known to the traveler who, after a long and perilous journeying, comes again in view of his home. But so it was with me, for I had traveled so much in the vicinity of Salt Lake that it had become my home in the wilderness. Smith was serious in his regard for the area where he had endured so much. In 1830, he compiled his notes for publication with maps of other explorers and trappers and a corrected map containing other valuable information about his travels and about the Indians. The French trader trapper, Etienne Prevost, could have used a little more information on the Indians. It was 1824. Prevost and his party were encamped in Utah Valley, where he ran afoul of an Indian. The Snake Ute chief, Mauve Gauche, visited Prevost's camp and proposed a treaty to be ratified by smoking the peace pipe. In the midst of the ceremony, however, Chief Gauche appeared to be nervous and restless. He stated that his guardian spirit was angry because of so much iron in their midst. The Indians then laid down their arms. Provost and his men followed their example by putting aside their own weapons, and the ceremony resumed. No sooner was the peace pipe ritual again underway, however, than the chief gave a signal. He and his braves fell upon the white men, drawing knives and tomahawks from beneath their blankets. The attack was sudden, and Provost's men were caught unarmed and off guard. Seventeen of them were killed, while Provost and four others escaped into the mountains. Smith had trouble with the desert. Provost had trouble with the Indians. 
other explorers, trappers, and travelers came and went, encountering varying degrees of trouble and hardship. One of these was Captain B.L.E. Bonneville, but he came back with glorious and fanciful descriptions of the scenic wonders of the Great Basin. He visited the Great Salt Lake in 1837 and reported, As you ascend the mountain, about its shores you behold this immense body of water spreading itself before you and stretching further and further in one wide, far-reaching expanse until the eye, wearied with continued and strained attention, rests in the blue distance upon lofty ranges of mountains, confidently asserted to rise from the bosom of the waters. Captain Bonneville's dream was riches. Father Jean-Pierre de Smet had his own dream. He dreamed of converting the Indians to Christianity and traveled to the Oregon Territory, setting up missions. He learned of the Great Basin through talking with others who had explored it. The most persistent dream of all was the old dream of the Buenaventura, the Good Luck River, the waterway to the Orient. In 1843, Colonel John C. Fremont organized a second party to survey and explore the Great Salt Lake and its surrounding country. Colonel Fremont had become known for his earlier work in exploring the Oregon Trail. He took with him the famed guide Kit Carson and one of Bonneville's trappers, Joseph Walker. They entered the Great Basin from the east spent two weeks exploring the eastern shore of the Salt Lake. Fremont's party went to an island now named for him, and from there they surveyed the lake. Kit Carson carved his signature and a cross in a rock on the island. They struck out west across the desert, heading straight toward Pilot Peak. They were on their own to travel across this desert. One Indian, a Ute, was prevailed upon to accompany them as a guide, but fear of other Indians overcame him and he turned back. Kit Carson took a scout party ahead starting early in the morning. Fremont and main party started out about two hours before sundown and walked through the night. Shortly before dawn, they camped near a low ridge and built a signal fire with sagebrush. That brought a man from the scouting party who rode up to announce that water had been found at Pilot Peak. They immediately broke camp and continued their journey. Late that afternoon, they found the spring at the foot of the mountain. After a few days rest, they pushed on to California. When they reached Sutter's Fort in California, they had marked a trail to California shorter by 250 to 300 miles than the old one. The first immigrant wagon train of 69 settlers going for California was headed by John Bidwell and Captain Bartleson. Their company headed out in May of 1841 and joined a company of missionaries headed by Father De Smet and guided by Thomas Fitzpatrick. They followed the Oregon Trail until Soda Springs there, the bidwell Bartleson group split, and half followed De Smet to Fort Hall, and then headed on to Oregon. The bidwell Bartleson party, now 32 in number, found the north shore of the Great Salt Lake. They had so much difficulty clearing a trail that they left the wagons, packed everything they could not carry on the oxen, mules, and horses, and headed on to California by way of the Humboldt River. It was now 1845, and the trail was ready for serious use by immigrants. Lansford W. Hastings, a veteran of Oregon Trail emigrations and an energetic promoter, put together a guidebook for immigrants. It included Fremont's discoveries, the latest maps, routes, and as he said on the title page, all necessary information relative to the equipment, supplies, and method of traveling. Hastings recruited four companies and started them out in succession on their way through to California. The Great Basin lay in wait. The first party was led by James Hudspeth. 
they went through on mules, missed the landmark Pilot Peak, but caught up with the trail along the Humboldt River. Hastings personally guided the third company. This was the second group to bring wagons through. They had such trouble negotiating Weber Canyon that Hastings left a note in a tree directing the fourth party to turn south. The fourth party was to become famous. It was the Donner Reed Party. They blazed the course through the Wasatch, which later became known as the Old Mormon Trail. It was used by the 49ers, the Overland Stage, Pony Express, and Johnston's Army. For 21 harrowing days, the Donner Party literally hewed its way the 36 miles through East Canyon and over big and little mountains to emerge upon the Salt Lake Valley. They camped in the valley, resting themselves and reviving their cattle with the thick grass of the valley. On September 9th, they started on the next leg of their journey, the journey that was to take them across the desert and through the Sierra Nevada mountains into California. There were many forces working against them, the relentless tedium of the trip across the desert, the dry and barren salt flats where they were forced to abandon wagons and animals, the physical barrier of the Sierra Nevada, their own spent strength which could not last forever. But most of all, time was against them, time that had to be spent hewing a passageway, time spent caring for cattle and broken wagons, time looking for water, time that brought the early snows to the Sierra Nevada and trapped them before they could reach their destination and their waiting friends. Of the original party of 79, only 45 reached California. Next year would be 1847, and the time had come for the dramatic adventure of the Great Basin to begin, the Mormon colonization. In Iowa and Nebraska, the refugees from Nauvoo prepared themselves. They needed peace and security from their enemies. They had read Fremont's report. The mountain rim basin seemed ideal. They needed range for their cattle, soil for their crops. The grasslands and river systems invited them. In Colorado, the sick detachment of the Mormon battalion and the Mississippi Saints prepared to meet the Saints along the trail. And the battalion in San Diego and the Brooklyn Saints prepared for their trip to the Great Basin. Reinforced in their knowledge and determination by Father Jean-Pierre de Smet at Winter Quarters, the Saints started west. Jim Bridger told them tales of early frost, vast desert areas, and little possibility of crops maturing. But they would be diligent. They would irrigate, and the Lord would bless them. Had not Isaiah prophesied, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Here in the Great Basin, the prophecy would be fulfilled. The saints would find a home, a place of refuge, a place of worship. Through hard work and perseverance, they would change the desert and make it prosper. They would build a city dedicated to God and their faith in him. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing.